Good evening. <laughs> Go on, Ed. <laughs> hey, you see that? Spots on the tongue. Yeah? Yellow jaundice, first symptoms. Oh, terrific, <laughs> Uncle Jack. Hey, that, that's mange. <laughs> Good evening, London, England, a busy modern city. I want to ask you, if I may tonight, to join me in an experiment, an experiment to turn back time, to suspend belief in the here and now and journey into the past. Come with me now to a London before two wars, when the city was very different to the one we live in now. And this house you see behind me was the London home of one of the most powerful men. Humour. What is it? Where does it come from? Is it genetic or environmental? Are comedians bored or are they made? Is bacon better with the rind on or the rind off? Can camels swim? Uh, are parrots merely fish with feathers? Can oysters do crossword puzzles? Jewish college footballers? Ow! Oh! oh, oh. Give that! Thank you. <coughs> I was born in the first floor front room of this uh, house here in this pleasant leafy suburb of Sheffield in May 1943, while my father was out at work at a toilet paper factory. Well, I say work, he was actually a, a manager there, he was a member of the managing classes. I remember him as a complex mixture of extreme irascibility and abundant but fairly basic humour. Now, Mum, don't worry about a thing. <laughs> Try and remember. You are going to sleep, you are remembering years and years ago. Yes. Can you remember? I mean, how... Was, was my father funny? Yes, he was, and I think he's passed it on to you, actually, in a way. He was in a quiet way, a very quiet sense of humour, but he certainly had got it. But he was a bit, in a sense of humour, uh, slightly, I can remember he used well, to enjoy was... buying things like dog, fake dog messes. Well, that's the sort of humour he had, fake dog messes. I shall never forget that day when he put the fake dog mess down. It was in the middle of a party, wasn't it? He wanted, he'd bought, he came home, he's quite, he's quite an adult man by then, wasn't he? I mean, oh, not yes, the sort of person to expect to come home with dog messages. But, uh, and he uh, expected uh, me to find it in a, when all the guests arrived, you see, <laughs> and wondered what on earth it was. It was really terrible, because it was terribly lifelike, yeah. dog mess. I Hard remember, because it was so funny, because he discovered it terribly yes. well, with a terrible shriek yes, of, yes. what's this? Yes. My mother and father were from Berkshire and Norfolk. And I don't think they ever really reconciled themselves to living in the North, in much the same way as I've never really reconciled myself to living in the South. After all, this was my home for 22 years. As children, my sister Angela and I were not exactly pampered, but we were secure. I went for walks, holiday trips to Norfolk, played French cricket and drank my welfare state orange juice. And at the grand age of five, I was promptly sent out into the world to be educated. Hey, then. Yes, I remember him. Um, rather a clever boy at Burtdale. He was from near the top of the class. And, uh, quiet. Not humorous, really. Uh, well, of course, we didn't have that kind of humor in those days, did we? Institutions are great breeding grounds for humor, and Burtdale was no exception. This is the actual playground where I first learnt the gentle art of playing the fool, as my teachers call it, or avoiding getting bashed up, as I called it. Not the sort of humour, really, that appeals to me, but um, I understand that uh, he's got a certain following, and when I talked to him about coming here, I said, well, I hope you're not going to try too much of it on here, and he assured me he wasn't, so we're very happy to have him. The first performances I ever remember giving in front of an audience, non-paying, were during the uh, morning break or after lunch here in this little place we called the Annex. I can remember doing improvisations in here. It must be about nine or ten, because it was vaguely satirical material about the coronation, the Duke of Edinburgh being caught short in the Abbey. More, um, mercifully, I can't remember. Laughter was all very well as a means of saving my skin in the playground or courting cheap popularity in the lunch hour, but in class it was not encouraged. In rooms like this, I first encountered the painful delights of being forbidden to laugh. Hello, boy! <laughs> How nice it is to be it's here! It's me! Ah, who said that? I would like Shut to up. say... <laughs> who was it? <laughs> right! 
The entire back three rows will come and beat me this evening. <laughs> so, even here, this comparatively early stage of his development, one can notice the essential dichotomy of the comet influence. Here, in these pleasant surroundings, we find a whole oneness and... Go away! We're trying to teach in here. Outside school, I spent most of my early years in the company of the boy next door, Graham Stuart Harris, now a chartered accountant. Oh, well, that, that was my scheme. That, that, that was, was my scheme. scheme. And for ten years, his parents almost well, became my own. More than about eight years of age. And one of you took the part of the BBC Home Service, mm -hmm. and the other one used to chip in with his remarks all the time. You had a wonderful time. Yeah. I always thought that you would do something in the entertaining world, but never what you are doing now. Never, never. BBC Home Service, either. <laughs> <laughs> Your minds are really rather funny, and we, we all found mm. them rather amusing. The odd one was, we thought, rather rude, but oh, then I don't that think... That was we, the odd one. Yes. Yeah. And it's I all changed now. Most of them are rude. <laughs> I don't think they'd be considered rude yeah. today. But he, he, was always a, he was always a lavatory attendant, wasn't he? He was a lavatory <laughs> attendant. Uh, he, uh, that was his favourite job. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it was a very close-knit yeah. kind well, of friendship, we've, wasn't we've it? We've been trying to work out sort of what we spent the time doing, and in fact, we were busy all the time. As John nice. Betjeman would say, over there, the Gaumont Cinema. That was what we used to do, wasn't it? Went to the cinema all the time. Yes, we went to the cinema, what, three times a week? How do we ever get the money? I, I can't remember. Well, I had my various schemes, but there was the yeah. very useful League of Pity box in your hall, oh, which, yeah. you know, no, we used no, to... No, 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 and I said, do you watch him? Oh, no, she said, I don't bother. I've seen it all acted in your kitchen. She yeah. said, uh, oh, I can't be bothered to watch it. <laughs> that would be our sky, you know, so, those dancing classes. We'd go down there in the car, and then when, when, when we'd been dropped off onto the bus down here in to see Guy Madison at Red Feather River. Yes, drop, we, we were always dropped off at dancing classes. I think they thought we always went. Yes. It's no wonder, uh, you know, again, for comedy, because the football pitch, remember, it's a 90 degree oh, slope yes. Oh, yes. on that bare slope up Hag Lane, yeah. and if oh, you kick yeah. the ball out, it fell 200 feet and bounced into the river. Boy, push disappear. the ball! Oh, yeah. People yeah. disappear down, abseiling down the rocks, off to yeah. find the ball. Oh. Come on, don't be silly! <laughs> After living through two world wars, my parents were understandably attracted to order and calm. But I found this security sometimes stifling. I was a romantic. I wanted to be an explorer or a sailor or a pilot. And I used to fuel my dreams with endless books from Sheffield Public Library. Then, in 1954, I first became aware of a radio show, which, for someone like me, with an absurd sense of humour and nowhere for it to go, was like manna from heaven. This is the BBC Light Programme, and candidly, I'm fed up with it. Have a care there, Wallace, otherwise I'll be forced to speak to John Snag. My dear fellow, everybody has to be forced to speak to John Snag. <laughs> um, curb those biting cynicisms and permit me to present the highly esteemed Goon Show! It's my... I live for the show. I mean, that, the, the, the day of the week so when I had I. the Goon Show kept me going for, for the, the entire week. I mean, we kept me going for six years. <laughs> I wish it kept me going longer, you know. <laughs> I was getting longer, actually. I had to stop. I was nearly six feet. So I had to stop the Goon Show. Otherwise, today I would have been 40 foot eight <laughs> and a thriving window cleaner. But did you know, by letters or any feedback at all, that there was this generation growing up who, who'd been totally liberated by No, the BBC the show. Kept, the, kept England secret from us, totally. <laughs> The voices is interesting. I mean, your, your voices, the, the, the crans, I mean, I'm not going to do them, because I, I tell you one very embarrassing The only time I ever spoke to Peter Sellers, who was a great hero of mine, a comic actor, I passed him in the studio once, and the only thing I could think of was saying... Oh, painful. Him, oh, I do You've got him before me. In the... uh, I, I just did a goon voice instantly, because I recognised him from, from, from Goon Show, and I felt such a fool afterwards. That's right. He but told those... me, he said, I passed a chap today who would look such a fool afterwards. <laughs> he's, he's all over the floor. <laughs> Well, where, did, where did the voices... Did you just sort of think about those as well, you were the, madly the, drunk one evening? Or what? Well, I don't know. I think that Colonel Chinstrap in Itmar was the basis of the inspiration for Major Bloodnock. Ah, yes. Uh, the arm. Um, yes, do, yes. Do. Oh, yeah. yes, sir. Open your wallet and say after me, 
Help yourself. Yes. <laughs> There's all such blatant humour. Yeah. There's no joke there. There's straightforward aggression upon the human race. Good, lovely. But where, where did where did Eccles, for instance? I often often mm. wonder. And I, I got his dad. He was da we're going to have his dad in. Uh, mm. Can you talk like that? My son, Eccles. Mm. And then that we never got around to that. <laughs> The last character was the little Jim one. Yeah. He's falling in, falling oh, in the butter. Oh, that little one, little Jim is Bill yeah. Bottle's brother. Yeah. Uh, they just, just, yeah. just by chance, like a, we had a good summer. Yeah. That's how it was. Who was that bum? The goons were quite inexplicable to my parents. They were my discovery. I'd found them. They were my heroes. Of course, any thought of ever emulating them was quite out of the question. But on my solitary bike rides into Derbyshire, I could always dream that one day perhaps something quite out of the question might just possibly happen. Now then, boys, as from Thursday, Paul Frizz will be administered on alternate Tuesdays only. Friday is St. Willoughby's Day, and dark grey trousers will be worn. Our preacher on Sunday will be the Reverend Arthur Travers Jardine by Fisher, Bishop of the Limpopo, and an old RS, who will talk on God and the Transvaal. Chapel will not be optional. O'Grady's begins on Mondays for Talisgrites only, and Mr. Dixon has the stumps. The film on Wednesday will be The Dam Buster, starring Richard Todd. Seating will be by the house and will commence from the north side entrance, except for Dillies, who will hop through Broadwick's gate in the normal way. Stop laughing, Palin! I spent four happy years at Shrewsbury School, doing Latin unseen, cleaning monitors' football boots, blistering my bum, rowing up the seven, and reluctantly respecting parental restrictions on my acting activities. Thus doing the decent thing, I worked my way through O-levels and A-levels towards the great goal my father had in mind for me. At the end of 1961, I went for an interview and exams at his old college, Clare, Cambridge. I failed. Sorry, terribly sorry. If I'd got in, I probably could have spent the rest of the year cycling round France, learning to tap dance or hitchhiking through Mongolia. Instead, I went to work at a Sheffield Steelworks. I wasn't doing anything butch like forging hot steel. I worked in the publicity department, the arts side of steel making. This involved interviewing people about racing pigeons against the noise of a ten-ton steam hammer. The only man who was really interesting swore so much I could use nothing he said. It all seemed rather hopeless until the day I met Jack Parkin. Well, how was it that I made the transition from steel making to acting? The Buffalo Score, the chap you worked with, and knew you were interested in the amateur theatre. I was involved, so they gave you my name, and I took you along to our rehearsal. And did you think I was just another young hopeful comes along? No, no, no. It was obvious from the beginning potential was there. <laughs> That's it. I said he has to say that because I just bought him a drink. Let's go and have a fight. It was in The Woodcarver, a very serious play indeed, that I made my debut on the Sheffield Amateur stage. One thing I really have missed, and that I haven't done since Sheffield, is doing a sustain, a complete play. And that's what I miss from our times in Sheffield. Really the, the Python and all that is, is bit mm. bitty, and it's sort of, uh, it tends to be short sketches. And film acting, again, is something that's done in short spurts. Yes. And I've yes. not done any theatre work. Well, I'm producing our next play, which will be casting about <laughs> a month, oh, a month from now. Oh, please. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I always thought you'd make something of it, but I never thought it'd be comedy, but... Thinking back on it, there was that twinkle in your eye oh that really did. You should have told me, really. Can you remember embracing on the sofa in the wood, wood carver? With a kiss? Oh, <laughs> or a romantic lead? Um, well, the only thing that I can remember going all that way back is that you were very easy to act with. 
but I never really thought you'd branch off into the comedy line. Yeah, we thought you'd have got some in, you know, you settled down and done a good job like something. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. My time with the BNC players ensured that the enjoyment of acting was quite decisively in my blood, when six months later I squeezed by the skin of my teeth into a university near Cambridge. Oxford University, one of the world's great seats of learning, but it's also a crucible, a melting pot of ideas, thoughts, <laughs> ideas. Yeah. Mm. Have a look. No. no. Right. At Brasenose College, I made another decisive friendship with Robert Hewison, a smooth, rather confident Londoner. Here we are, the portals of our, our college. Brasenose revisited. <laughs> the only college, as far as I know, named after a part of the body. Well, which part is that? Uh, Braze, the Braze. Braze and theirs. And we met here just because uh, this is, I can remember this bit here was where we actually first met, both history undergraduates. That's right. And yes. you were funny. I can remember you were funny. Well, I and was I nervous. disliked you. I was nervous. That was why. <laughs> what do you remember of, of, of that meeting? Well, I remember, I do remember I was the only one who wasn't wearing a suit. Really? I think it was because well, I, I, well, I had a suit then. Yes, indeed. Oh, you were very I, much the. I got into those young, terrible baggy bright, cords I used no, to wear. No, you were very much nice and bright. But I think, uh, although the fact it was quite an accident, same college, reading the same subject, the important thing is that we both decided independently to go and do some theatre, and we did auditions. But it, was, it was serious theatre, not not funny yeah, straight oh, away, serious. was it? I think I think Lope de Vega did serious. But that wasn't terribly funny until. I heard what Terry Jones said about it the night after he'd seen it. It was <laughs> the, the thing funniest was, thing he'd fourth, ever seen in Oxford. It was fourth and third peasant. We hadn't had very much to do. But did we want to do everything? We wanted to do a bit of serious acting, a bit of review? Was it so Robert and I ended up as friends rather than rivals. And it was largely as a reaction to the intense seriousness with which Oxford Theatre treated itself that we took to comedy. In the autumn of 1962, high up in that part of the college, familiarly known as the Arab Quarter, I remember taking the first faltering steps towards writing funny sketches. So I went around... Do you want to ask him? Yes, please. But I got covered in the rain. Oh, I'm going down. Song, type one minute. Automobile sketch. Three minutes interviews. Three minutes. Look. Well, Robert, this isn't a bad recreation of those early cabaret writing days. It's the same salad. Same salad, yes. I can see that. Cucumber slightly straight than it used to be. But this was your room, and we used to write here, didn't we? We didn't write in my room for some reason. I don't know why that was. Well, your room, your room is in a basement, and it was in the middle of college, and up here sort of was rather hidden away, but at the same time, we could actually sit up here and by the table and look out of the window and see life passing by. You know, not undergraduate right. life, but uh, real people. Um, do you remember we used to, we did used to speak in funny voices all the time. It must have been the golden <laughs> era of funny voices. It did, wasn't it, Bobo, that, mate? That's oh, right. Feel that like um, cucumber. Yes, we did. We yes. chose very amusing voices for speaking in, yeah? Ah, uh, yes. It's usually copied from Spike, unfortunately. <laughs> This is a historic document. Mm. The programme, the running order we made up for our very first cabaret, the Oxford University Psychology Party. What, I mean, what memories do you have? How did we get that <laughs> gig, our first gig? I do remember actually sort of saying, look, Mike, you know, this, mm. we have this very funny relationship, mm. as it were. Uh, sorry. Well, <laughs> we have this comic, <laughs> comic partnership. Mm. Why don't we structure it in mm. some way? Um, let's go and do a 20-minute cabaret or a half-hour cabaret, something like that. Mm -hmm. And and mm -hmm. I said, mm -hmm. and we'll get paid because this guy's actually offering mm -hmm. us five bob each. It, it is, is to you, my friends, friends to whom they look for support. And, and you, my, you friends, my friends, who your friendship, friendship give it. Well, we, we say that this has gone on for too long. Too long, too long by far. How can we in the world today reasonably permit such a state of affairs to continue? The answer is no. Yes. A couple of years ago... Thirty years ago... A very good comrade of mine... An old colleague of mine... Who is now no longer with us... Who is now far from us... But a junior minister... Uh, but dead... Had the courage to state... Mentioned after dinner... Our, our position, position has not changed, changed. Only altered according to the circumstances. Stirring well to the time I've been here. When all the way you're going on and on. When you're all the way you're on and on. I mean, I 
had a theory, which was that this was just I after... I had a theory. <laughs> <laughs> this was just after Beyond the Fringe, and so there was a certain kind of comedy which meant undergraduate comedy was seen as funny, but at the same time, that had all been done. In fact, we wrote a terrible song called I Will Never Go Beyond the Fringe. Mm. So we had to do something like that, any different. We führen ab alten der de BBC Tüver da. Wir rennen after after play Pip, 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 pip. Tide, tide auf dem Bang, auf der alten Bang, tide gesplitt. Tide am Schüttelgün, am Schüttelgün, tide gesplitt, ohne viel gewinnen. Ja, ja, tide, lovely tide. Hm. Sehr, sehr gut. Hm. And so, in the Oxford University Union Cellars, a star was born. Of course, in those days, it was debutantes rather than beer barrels, wasn't it, Mike? You're right. <laughs> in my second year at university, I was chosen as one of a cast of five to go to Edinburgh to write and present the Oxford Review at the festival. Then, as now, a national showplace for what is known and feared the world over, as undergraduate humour. I've invented the long range telescope, built it in my backyard. It's began to square and all the fucking down. Our review that year, as many Oxford shows before and since, was largely produced in the Roman Eagle Masonic Lodge. John Gould, Terry Jones and myself were three of the cast. I always say D wood. He's 60 feet long and the length is all long. And I've always spoken in the morning. I don't remember anymore. Everybody stop there. They don't like that. Oh, they're writing like that. Thank goodness. <laughs> you actually did that in review. Yes. Uh, I remember it. Was a tuba. You had a tuba in the background. Yes, that's right. Yes, tuba exploded at the end. That's it, you did. That's and this is where we rehearsed in. A Masonic Lodge. Actually, we slept in here. We slept here, we slept here on, on sea mess. There's about 20 of us sleeping in this hall here. Guys, that's right. And but boy, it was boys nice are down here, here and the girls, girls upstairs. upstairs. Yeah, none of that. None of that. None, then. none, none, of, none of that. None of that. Those days. And then the moment arrived. And we came to here, the great temple of the arts, the Cranston Street Hall. Oh, the name! What it yes. meant in those days. The Cranston Street oh, Hall was hired out to us for the purveyance of comic entertainment by the Parks and Burials Department of Edinburgh Council. Cranston Street Hall exists still. Oh, this is where it all began. It hasn't been eaten by Death Watch. God, yeah, it's, it's incredible. The happy, um, one of the happiest performing days yeah. of my life in this hall. There's nothing to lose, then. <laughs> still got our blackout up. I remember putting yeah. that up. Oh, that was a big effort. Oh, dear, now ballot boxes. Quick, well, how did they find, find out? How did she do it? How did that do it? <laughs> Terry, look. Amazing. Look. Good Lord. All Oxford Review in Edinburgh, 1963. Must be our old sketch. The programme itself, designed by you. Good Lord, yes, indeed. This is. Quick, quick. I'll find this. What is this? It's not It's not a review. It's a scrapbook with our old reviews in my Dated 1963, the Scotsman with quivering finger. Oh, yes. He looks down. Listen to this. What they said about us. It is much more than a stimulant. This is the Oxford Review. Mm -hmm. It is much more than a stimulant for culture-sated minds or a pleasant nightcap. It is proof that a new generation of satirists with fresh style are rising fast through the debris of mediocrity left in the wake of those now rather passe no. subculture <laughs> symbols beyond the fringe. <laughs> TW3, the establishment and private eye. Read it, my oh, I can't. No more, no more. <laughs> Dear me. Really, what they said. What, 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 what they said about? These kind of things. Yeah, what is this? Two actors? What's this? From no. Scotland Yard's archives, we present the amazing tale of Dandy Jim. The story you are about to hear is absolutely true. Only the facts have been changed to fit the voices of our actors. <laughs> the scene oh, is a police station. Oh, this, I like this bit, yes. Oh, it's a joke. Ah, morning, Super. Ah, morning, wonderful. That's a joke, you see. That was a joke. That's <laughs> that one. Isn't First it? joke I remember. Oh, oh, there oh, we that, are. One of my favourites. Oh, that's two Scottish policemen suddenly discovering... Uh, excuse me. Uh, oh, one, one, of Himmler, 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 one of them is Himmler, one of them is... Thingy. It's Wind not up. satire, is it, Mike? It isn't it satire. Is satire. No, I, know, but I, we know. Never thought, I never really thought it was, because that, 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 that time seemed to have passed. Oh, rehearsal, oh, Terry. Oh, 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 I sing, oh, I was Miss World from 1907 <laughs> to 24. I, I was Miss World. 
What I remember about the difference between doing a review in Oxford and Edinburgh was in Edinburgh people noticed you and people from the outside world, impresarios and <laughs> David Foss coming backstage and sort of um, talking to you and you know people from London sort of taking notice. You get, gradually got the feeling that it was going in a direction. That's right, yes. It was the first time, first thing I've ever done, I think, that I felt suddenly there possibly is a chance that one could do this. Yeah. Professionally, people might actually pay you later on to do it. It was exciting, wasn't it? Yeah, it There's was. There's no magic to it, I think. Mm. The world of entertainment, which seemed so utterly remote to me in Sheffield, came a lot nearer in Edinburgh. But I was still supposed to be being educated. I was at Oxford to study history, not comedy. In those days, the two were not as inextricably linked as they've recently become. In a burst of solid and carefully selective cramming in the college library, I did three years' work in three months, and much to my surprise and everyone else's, emerged with a respectable second-class degree in modern history. In the summer of 1965, I left Oxford for good. I'd been in full-time education since 1948, and I couldn't stall any longer. It was time to take a decision, to be serious and frustrated, or funny and poor. As the dreaming spires slipped away behind the scrapyards of Botley, I decided that there was very little future for me in any respectable profession. I was one of that cursed generation, doomed to take nothing seriously at all. Not for me the management training scheme, the marketing course, the promotion, the annual bonus, or the works outing. After 17 years of the finest education the country could afford, all that lay ahead for me was the silly walk and the funny voice, the zany costume, the wacky one-liner and the false breasts. Where had it all gone wrong? I think we have to look very closely here at the dual standard set by society, the whole system of rewards and incentives which we set ourselves, and also the fact that he was very lucky. That's the thing that gets me most. He was such a lucky, lucky little bastard. Overprivileged, overeducated Oxford, goody goody. Oh, if I had half his luck, I wouldn't be doing this bloody job. Lucky, lucky bastard. Lucky, lucky, he's fine. Ha ha. A word in the right place, a smile at the right time. That's all it takes, you know. It's nothing to do with brains, it's nothing to do with hard work and qualification. And it's them, it's pure and simple, God is luck. Just because I went to Cardiff, I'm stuck as a bloody sociologist, screwing up my life, trying to find out why everyone else is so unhappy. Oh, I can't bear it. I can't bear it. Oh, lucky. 